So this is the, um, now in my world I'd call this boulder fabric, but what do you call this guys? This is a non-woven geotextile underlayment fabric. Heavy, <laughs> heavy duty stuff. This, this two actually, different grades. Right? We have a heavier duty than this. Okay, so this is your just your standard Rough stuff. Standard. And what this does, this prevents the EPDM liner from getting ripped, torn, or ruptured by any sharp objects underneath it. Correct. Now, uh, if you're correct. in really bad soils, you got a heavier duty, much heavier duty fabric, right? Correct. The other thing that this does is it increases the load bearing capacity of the soils. So by having a geotextile like this, it's gonna spread the weight out over a bigger area and gives us a little more structural stability and it allows the bottom of the po uh, pond to breathe. So it allows moisture and gases to wick out from underneath. So, so yeah, if you didn't know what I was talking about with carpet, you can use carpet as an underlayment. But obviously they've got this down to a science. Don't break the pattern. I said that earlier, now I need to, I need to live up to what I'm saying. If you guys are just tuning in, this is part two. We are going to teach you guys how to build an 11 by 16 pond. That's a full size pond with a waterfall in five hours. We're also going to lay out exactly how many tons of boulders and stones you need, about what size of those materials that you have to have, what pond kit to buy and where to buy it, and exactly how many labor hours total you should invest in a project like this. By the time you're done with this two-part video, you should feel pretty comfortable being able to go out onto a job site and tackle a job like that. That's the goal of this video. And if you guys are looking at installing ponds and this was not enough information for you, go to Greg's channel. What channel do you want them to go to? Team Aquascape? Or Team Aquascape is the construction. Greg looks like the pond guys live in the Aquascape lifestyle. So make sure you go to those channels. I'll link them down below. I'm also, you guys, I'm going to link the kits down below. I'm going to link everything that you guys need. Four guys. Can you make it there? Okay, so while Ed's working on the liner, you guys actually have a, a, a system down for what the next steps are. Yeah, so at this point, you know, all of us have been working together as a team to get to this stage right here. Our rocks were delivered at nine o'clock, 9.30. Super, super important. Your rocks have to be there before this is done being excavated, right? If the rocks show up at one o'clock, there goes our one day pond. We're never gonna finish this thing because we started rocking in the pond too late in the day. So we've gone to the end of the driveway. Three of us have pulled off to go get the rocks. One guy is staying back, getting some of the wrinkles out. He's gonna hook up the skimmer. Those three guys are going to use the wheelbarrow and the tree dolly to start bringing rocks to the edge of the pond. Once there's a decent sized pile of rocks at the edge of the pond, then we start handing them to each other to rock the pond in. At a certain point, then we put in the lights. After the lights are in, then we go get the gravel. But we've all been working together as a team. The, we're building a one day pond, no matter what, the pond needs to be rocked in before we break for lunch. So even during lunch, something's happening to finish the pond it's filling up with water. Because it's gonna take a few hours for this thing to fill up. So you wanna take advantage of that 45 minute hour lunch break, whatever your lunch break is, to achieve another step. Okay. And it'll be filling up. Then after lunch, it's really close to being filled. A couple guys go work on the waterfalls and the other guys can start doing the edge treatments along the edge. And they can do the edge treatments that much more accurately because the pond's already full. And that makes sense. What time, for a one day pond, what time do you start on site? We're usually there by 8.30. You know, we show up at 8.30 at the latest, eight o'clock. Push lunch if you have to, a half an hour, an hour, just to get to that stage. Hold it, science, guys. This is down to a science. I freaking love, I love it when, this is, you're watching 25 years of, of experience of trial and error and, oh, that didn't work and this didn't work and, these guys actually literally created these kits because they got sick of using other people's garbage. They got this all down. So what are we looking at right here, you guys? So this is our skimmer assembly. So what this is gonna do, it's gonna make a watertight seal between the liner and the skimmer box itself. It's gonna allow water to go from the pond into our pump. So we have a, uh, this type of an assembly. This is an adjustable uh, face plate. So in case we're off a little bit on our transit measurement, it gives us a little bit of flexibility. We could raise or lower this by three inches so we could increase water level or decrease it accordingly uh, to make sure that we fine tune it exactly. This can be a little bit confusing. Uh, so just make sure that you line the, the two on the bottom, one on the top up. Okay. 
um, those machine screws yep. um, act as guides. So those just slide through the top two corners like so. Hands free now. Okay. Hand, hands, well, kind of. Um, but these, the ends of them here, they're machined to be almost what alls, right? Yes, or hole punches, exactly. right? So um, the liner will actually penetrate, or these will penetrate through the liner. So I'm going to put a bead of silicone around okay. the perimeter right here, covering up all those holes. And, and that's the, that plate goes over the liner. So over the, liner the liner goes up. Yep. Okay, got it. Okay, so the silicone goes right, in. was the champ? Raining. We can't put them yeah, down in here. That's a good way here. to bust your teeth out. Eyes up. Eyes up, ears open. Just to keep this liner nice and hot and smooth, okay. right? Um, it's always nice if you can give yourself a little bit of slack, um, you know, like a little four, four inch fold of liner down below the skimmer so that if you ever have to possibly reseal this thing or if um, maybe it, it shifts or something with the heave and thaw in some of the, the northern climates with the free thaw cycle, um, it's a little bit easier um, post installation to fix. So I want to make sure that stays up nice and high. Through there. Almost. There we go. There's one. Yep. Now I'm going to take the face plate. Okay. Remember one on the top, two on the bottom. Okay. Okay. Slide it up there. Got to pull this out. Make sure, again, make sure that liner is nice and taut. And through there, you don't have any wrinkles, can make things, make your life difficult. Right? Okay. So now what I'll do, since I've got that, got the liner getting pressed up in there. I've got my awl. So you just punctured the liner. Down at the bottom. Okay. That's gotta be a nerve wracking part of the... A you know, it yeah. can be. Anytime you make a, a puncture a through the, the liner. liner. But these are repairable too, so. They are, um, but you don't wanna you don't want to do it on, on that premise. Yeah, you don't want to do it on purpose. Right. And then just come over here. Now this is where that second guy, if you don't have long arms, can come into play. Okay. So it's opening down the bottom of that skimmer plate. Yeah, you don't want to go too nuts with the screwdriver. Because you don't want to put a hole in the liner. You know. Yeah, if you slit like that. Yeah. Yep. So Ed, you're just piecing together the walls, the uh, the contours right now. We'll exactly, and one of the things um, you notice I'm starting on the top, even though other people are working in here, you want to start, I should say the bottom. I'm starting on the bottom, the reason I'm doing that is it's gonna pull the liner in place. If I were to come in here and start setting all the big ones on top, it'll end up putting tension on the liner, and then all of a sudden the liner's not gonna conform to everything. I'm going to get a couple bucket loads of gravel, start filling in behind those rocks, so kind of lock everything in place. What if they don't put anything in the pond? That works really nice too. If they don't put anything in the pond, the problem's going to be multiple things. Number one, biological filtration. Um, by having all the rock and gravel, every square inch of this rock is going to become a habitat and a home for algae, for different types of more microorganisms, which are food for the fish as well as they help to control water quality. Next thing that's going to happen is you're not going to have any ballast. So if you don't have any rock down here in the bottom, every spring, I guarantee it, you're going to get a big bubble underneath the bottom of the liner. That's because you have water coming in. So water is gonna displace water very easily. This pound for pound per cubic foot is much heavier than water, obviously. That's gonna give it weight down the bottom. It's gonna push the water through our fabric, which is also part of that system, and allow it to go into the uh, surrounding area. The other thing that it's gonna do, it's gonna look hideous. By ha not having any rock and gravel inside of this thing, it's gonna look awful. Final thing is all of that soil What's holding it in place? If you were going to do a retaining wall at somebody's homes, you're not just going to cut out a section of soil and leave it exposed. It'll eventually slump over. So eventually, if there was no stone here, this is going to start collapsing in and then the pond will slowly implode on itself. I 
got a question for you. You put a lot of artistic design into this. Can I see right behind you? Yep. Why? Because nobody's going to see it. They're going to see it because our viewing area is right there. And the water is going to be crystal clear. Huh? And it's getting rid of that ring of necklace, ring of uh, pearls necklace type of a, a look. So by having these little unique things, it just adds interest. And, and that's the fun part of the job. You know, you're always thinking of, okay, if I, this is how I want this to look. Viewing, looking down, creating layers and structures and breeding areas for, for fish, etc. Okay, so destination boulder is what? So when we explain rocks to customers, these types of rocks would not necessarily tell me or invite me to come walk up on the edge of the pond because of the round nature of them, the size of them. I always say either you're falling in or the rock's falling in, right? A destination boulder is a little bit bigger rock, flatter surface, the kind of rock that invites you to walk up and stand up on top of it. And so we call them destination boulders, some people call them fish feeding rocks, you know, stuff like that. We've got butt rocks, destination boulders, waterfall stones. What's a butt rock? Put your butt on it. Sit, and sit down? <laughs> sit on, like a rock that you would sit on. Oh. It'd be very close to the destination boulder. We always encourage people to interact with the pond as much as possible. That's just part of the reason bringing it up close to the main viewing area. But kids will be kids. There's no way you're going to keep kids there on the deck or the patio. So if you give the kids and adults like a place to actually walk to, then they'll focus on those areas. Okay. Okay, so Ed and Tim right now are working on uh, digging out for the frame rocks, right Ed? Exactly, so we're thinking about where the waterfall is going, we're making a series of ledges that the uh, boulders are gonna sit on. We're also kind of getting the vision of how we want that water to twist and turn its way around. So let's look at a set of frame rocks. All waterfalls go by the formula of having two frame rocks and then a waterfall in between. So look at this, frame rock, frame rock, waterfall in between. Frame rock, frame rock, waterfall in between. It's a very simple formula. It works over and over again and it actually looks very natural. Okay you guys, it's time for a uh, time update. We set the timer when we started at 1600 this morning. We're at 2000. The, technically the clock says we've been working on this for four hours, but we had an hour break for a photo session for you guys, and then we had an hour for lunch. So realistically, we've got to take two hours off that clock. That means we were, we're literally two hours into this project, and this is where we're at right now. So you guys don't mess around with filling it. I mean, you get on that right away, don't you? What's that? Filling the pond. Well, yeah, so like I said before lunch, we really want to get this thing filling. So at this point, like, I can tell that there's probably only another 15 minutes to rock in that section there. Chris is kind of tidying up some stuff over here. So I'd come in here, start rinsing from the top down, moving all the debris and dust and everything down to the lowest point. We put a clean out pump down there and we pump this dirty water out until it starts pumping out clear. At that point, we'll start filling it. Okay. Um, I strongly suggest getting a water meter so you can attach a water meter to the end of the hose and it'll count how many gallons you're putting in the pond because every homeowner wants to know exactly, every homeowner wants to know exactly how many gallons are in the pond and so it'll tell you to the gallon how many gallons are in here. That way then they can accurately add the necessary water treatments and oh, stuff like that. Yeah. If you don't have a water meter, something we've done in the past is time filling up a five gallon bucket and then just do the math. Oh yeah. We have the dirty water, wash the gravel down. Yeah, we started at 1600. Yeah, raise it up. Yep. So Brian's checking all of the water elevations, so he knows right where his water is going to be at. And if you know, worst case scenario, you could drop the water down a titch too. Yes, you could. could. Right? You could because drop it down. We have an, the adjustable an, faceplate. We yep. could drop that down. We could split it. Yeah, I was just going to say you could drop the water elevation down by about an inch. Exactly. For security. Yep. And it wouldn't really impact what's going on out here. It's pretty good much. by eye. You guys got it. So you guys manually raised it up, Ed? We did. 
All right, so you raised it up to get your elevation changed. So you peeled Correct. the fabric back, put more soil in place, raised it up. That way you got your comfort zone established for your uh, overlap. Yep. So we're looking at the edge treatment. I see you don't have the ring of pearls or the we do not. So edge treatment is probably the most critical part when you start doing the detail stuff. And that's because that's what the people are going to see. That's where people are going to come into contact with it. We have our deck, we have the viewing areas, we have a little walkway cutting across. So as people are interacting with the water feature, the first thing that they're going to notice is where the water ends the rocks are there and then the landscaping begins. So you want a, a really unique transition. You don't want it to look uh, man-made. You don't want it to look perfect. Should have differences in elevation. You should have big boulders, little boulders, river rock, planted pockets, decks, different hardscapes and things coming into contact with it because that's really what gives it that naturalistic appearance. That's what really makes it all work together. So the edge treatment takes time. We're trimming, we're tucking the liner. We don't want to just randomly come in here and start throwing gravel all over the stuff. You see, we have very strategic locations, big rock, uh, different types of river rock. We have soil coming right up to the back of those stones. All of those are going to create different uh, viewing areas and it kind of uh, plays with the senses a little bit. All over, probably. All right, so you guys are actually installing stones into the spillway and you have a cover that goes over the top of that? No. This is left open. So you have, you want, um, this is creating like a pool, just like another pool of the water feature. This is going to well up with water and overflow. We need to get to those uh, skimmer, or these filter pads once a year for cleaning. So we don't want to totally co cover it up. The other thing that we'll do is we'll put aquatic plants up inside of here. Okay. So you have plants. Ed, can you pull, uh, Brian, one of you guys, can you pull that pad out so these guys can see the skimmer pad that Ed was just talking about? So you have to be able to get to those. Oh my, uh, did I screw something? Oh, no, no, you're good. You see this slot right here? Yep. That's, that allows you to be able to pull these out without having to take the whole tray out. Okay, okay. So that's your pad. That's your upper filter pad that yeah. has to be changed once a year. Yep. Washed off. Washed, washed off. off. Well, washed off. Yeah, yep, Correct. yep. Okay. Because those things last for a long oh, yeah. time. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, word of caution. You've got to buy pond safe filter pads. Don't go to Menards and you'll see rain gutter filter pads that goes in there. Uh, you, you can't use regular um, other material because they actually have agents in there that will kill the fish. Trust me. Lesson learned. All right, so now we are foaming in. We actually asked about a cover over this. And a lot of people will do that. They'll just take a big piece of slate and put it over the top of that. If you think about it, it's kind of like which rock doesn't belong. Right? Everything's been round and, and a certain look and then to take this big thin piece of slate and put it on top looks ridiculous. Then you're putting stuff on top of the slate to try to hide the piece of slate. Use landscape. So give me a plant name like a, I don't know, a Ketonias or a Hasta, you know, a Hasta will work, right? So you get a, like a sum and substance hosta that gets this big, right? Half the plant covers this entire thing. Yep. So use landscape to actually help soften this up more. Putting some giant lid on this will make it look ridiculous. It'll piss me off is what it'll do. Brian will come to your house, <laughs> say this is not a certified what, what aquascape. What have you done? <laughs> Which you did not, where did you learn this from? Don't say dirt monkey. <laughs> We do have a repo program. It's not Here's, done properly, we're gonna rip it out for you. Just leave that open. <laughs> use plants. I mean, you think about it, you use a plant to hide an air conditioner. If you can't figure out a plant to come over the edge of this, then shame on you. The pond kit for this, mm -hmm. Chris was saying something that I want to catch, comes with what? The best part Even is this. that, is, is the welcome kit. Not to pat Brian on the back or anything, but what he's really good about is uh -huh. giving that that new customer, that new that new client, um, just this overwhelming sense of <laughs> joy and happiness, right? And it's and it's all through celebrating the lifestyle and and getting them to feel all the warm fuzzies about having a new water feature. So. This kid is the second best thing from having Brian deliver that message, is we've kind of put everything into a kit. That's the best, yep, thumb drive. Nothing says I love you, and you'll love your pond like a thumb drive. But what's on it is, like, so here's what happens is we finish a project, 
products. And there's no way the customers are gonna remember everything we went over. How to maintain the skimmer, how to do the dosing system, what about leaks, how to do the lights, the transformers, the ion gen, right? All these different things that need to happen. This goes over everything. But what we tell customers every single time is, listen, I expect you to re retain maybe 1% of what I've just told you because they're giddy, right? They're excited. This is something they've dreamt of having forever. They're so focused on just the aesthetics and when are they gonna have their first pond party and everything else. So I say, don't worry about it. We're gonna set up an appointment two weeks later, write down all the questions you might have in that next two weeks and then we'll address it when you're ready to go over that kind of stuff again. Okay, so we got the skimmer running. We've and already can, showed us the basket. Right, and you can see how these leaves are now, all this debris is slowly coming in here. Now, if you want to maintain this, here's a trick. You take this door right here, close it. When I do that, the pump stays on, and you're going to see the water level diminish in here. Now I can take this out and really get an idea of what's going on inside this. It exposes that filter mat. So now I can come in here without getting my hand frozen in that cold water especially this time of year, pull this out. Below that, can you see that rack down there? This guy here. That's what supports this filter mat. If I need it to get to my pump, all I do is I twist. Obviously, I want to shut this off. If I try to un untwist it now, I'm going to get pretty wet. But I would come in here, and you can see how easy this is to twist. I would just twist this completely off pull this out and then I can get to my pump. Okay, here we go. We're about to give birth to a new waterfalls. Hey, all right, not bad guys. And now the little tweaks. I like how you split it. Every waterfall is a unique work of art, one of a kind, custom creation, but the process to make it remains the same. Just because it's creative doesn't mean that you have to do something different to build it. It's always the same process. And when you do that, you can get trained guys that can replicate a process and then that's when you can make the money. All right, so we started at 1600. All right. We had a two hour uh, right, picture taking, lunch, lunch break. and everything else. We're at 2259, we're gonna call that 2300. So 2100, so you did it in five hours. Nice. 15 man hours? Bam. Ooh. Well, and actually we would have included lunch in part of that day. So it's a six, still a six man hour day. Would you believe they could have done that? And so now you're looking at this, Tim. Would you believe that you can install something like that in a single day? Oh, uh, when you get the experience, I believe, yeah. Before, if, if I would have told you, would you believe? No, no, but yeah, I, I don't think that you could, no. I hope this video has helped you out. A big thanks goes out to Greg for letting us hang out here for a couple days. Big thanks to Brian, Chris, hello, <laughs> and the scientist, Tim the Rookie. I hope this video has helped you guys out. We've got everything listed down below where we've, we've got links to the materials that you need to be able to build this. And if you guys are looking for more information, go visit Greg's channel. At, hey, do you want him at Team Aquascape or do you want Greg to- Team Aquascape is the construction channel, the how-tos. Greg Witzak, the pond guy, is living the Aquascape lifestyles. There you go. Go check out his stuff. God bless you guys. Go get them and check out these other videos right here.